Welcome, everyone. Welcome, everyone. I'm Margaret Holm. I'm a board member with First Things First Okanagan, and we are co host of this evening's webinar with the District of Summerland. We're grateful to live on land that is the traditional and unceded territory of the seal who call the Okanagan home for thousands of years. And we are also grateful for cultural venues like the Anaukan Center and the Penticton Art Gallery who are collaborating on three dynamic exhibits at the Penticton Art Gallery until mid-May. In the main gallery, um, the National Indigenous Professional Artist Training Program is celebrating its 20th anniversary so there's artwork by uh, current learners, faculty, and invited Indigenous artists. And there's a very dynamic exhibit by the CF artist Levi Bent in one of the side galleries, as well as Clayton Gauthier from Prince George. So it's definitely worth checking out in the remaining three weeks. If you didn't catch it during the Ignite the Arts Festival, you've got time left. And that's where I'm going to be tomorrow. So this is First Things First, a 22nd deep dive seminar. We feature speakers who bring different perspectives on community climate issues and solutions. So what we hope is that by learning and talking together, we can build connections and gain insight in what we can accomplish here in the Okanagan. So I'll let Odessa Cohen from Summerland um, take it away. She is the MC for this evening, thanks. Thank you so much, Margaret. Uh, so yes, my name is Odessa. I'm with the District of Summerland. Uh, I'm the Sustainability Coordinator there. Uh, so we've coordinated with First Things First as part of Summerland's Earth Week celebrations this year. Uh, the theme uh, for this year has been around food security and resilience from climate change. Uh, so this is a particularly topical discussion following all the climatic events that we've had over the last few years, uh, being heat waves, flooding, and wildfires uh, that have increased in frequency and intensity um, over the past decade. Our region in the Okanagan Snow Kameen and Okanagan Silk Territories is rich in bountiful food resources, and the threats to our community from climate change have a direct impact on our food systems in this region. So without further ado, I will introduce our three panelists today. Uh, first, we have Tracy Kim Bonneau, who lives in the Okanagan on the Penticton Indian Reserve. Tracy is an award-winning television writer, producer, and director who in 2016 received four LEO nominations from the Motion Picture Arts and Sciences Foundation of BC. In 2018, Tracy was awarded the Aboriginal Business Excellence Award from the Penticton Chamber of Commerce for her contributions to the local economy within the film and television industry. Her current work has been on the documentary series, Quest for West Wild Food on the Aboriginal's People's Television, which has its fourth season airing this May. The series explores people's oral history of wild and organic food in BC with stories of indigenous food, history, culture, and cuisine. Tracy is also employed uh, by the nonprofit organization, the Nwekan, uh Center in Penticton. So welcome, Tracy. Uh, our next speaker today is Lisa Scott. Uh, she was born and raised in the Okanagan and is a registered professional biologist and has worked as a consultant in the field of invasive species management, environmental assessments, and conservation planning for, uh, for 27 years. Lisa has been the executive director of the Okanagan and Similkameen Invasive Species Society, or OASIS, since its inception in 1996, and is currently chair and founder of the Summerland Environmental Science Group, and a former member of the Summerland's Community Climate Action Advisory Committee. Lisa was the founder of both Summerland's Earth Day and Earth Week celebrations. In 2011, Lisa was named Summerland Citizen of the Year, and in 2017, she was recognized by Earth Day Canada as a finalist for the Hometown Hero Award. So welcome, Lisa. Lastly, we have Ella Braden. Ella is an or uh, orchardist and market gardener in Summerland. She is also a scientist and science and ecology educator who loves synthesizing knowledge from diverse resources to find creative solutions to feed her community and create a resilient whole farm ecosystem. In 2020, she began the process of converting five and a half acres of conventional apple monoculture to a diversified, sustainable polyculture farm. She now produces vegetables, tree fruit, small fruits, grains, eggs, teas, and herbs, as an, uh, and is an advocate for small-scale agriculture. She has served on the board of Incredible Edible Penticton and the Penticton Food Security Working Group. So welcome, Ella. 
So this panel today is going to function uh, in two parts. So I'm going to start off uh, with questions for each of our speakers, and they will respond and have five minutes. Then the next section will go to a single question that will be uh, uh, answered by each of the speakers with also five minutes to answer. Uh, at the end of that, uh, with the remaining time, we will provide a question and answer period. You can either open your audio and speak, or you can use the chat box, uh, which I will monitor and share with the speakers. And if you have someone in particular that you'd like to speak or have a question put to, just put their name in there uh, that you would like it directed at. So we will get started on our uh, speaker questions. We will start off with Tracy. So your documentary series, Quest Out West Wild Food on the Aboriginal People's Television Network premiered in 2021 and has provided you the opportunity to experience and learn more about the wild foods across the Okanagan Territory. In connecting with the harvesters and growers in the region, how has their work on the land helped establish or improve food security in those respective communities? And has climate change and COVID-19 had an impact at all? Um. Thank you, Odessa. <laughs> that's quite a that's quite a lot to pack in five minutes, and um, I'm not going to share the screen because I I think it's it's best just to tackle the you know the questions at hand. But first, I want to really thank everyone here for participating in this very important event, uh, kicking off Earth Week and all of the work that we're all so deeply committed to. So when, um, you know, I, there's a couple of components to that question. And, and, the, and I think the first question is, is the work that I do in terms of myself as a seal woman and as a harvester, as a knowledge keeper and someone that is interconnected to the land and the plants and the animals. One of the things that I really began to understand as I became more focused towards the fourth season is that food security must include not just us as human beings, but but the plants, the animals, and every living uh, species, uh, because um, we know that, for example, the huckleberries that we harvest, we know that our grizzly bears depend on that food and and there's a cycle uh, that we have to uh, work together so that it can be sustainable for for everyone and and so those were some of the things that I really explored and spoke to traditional knowledge keepers during you know during my time producing quest out west um, and the second part of the question um, climate change has had a significant impact on food security for again not just us as human beings but for our relatives in the water out on the land all of our our um, animals are being displaced and there are food sources, but they require food sources as well. And so with the extreme heat, and we know that the indicators where us as knowledge keepers, we know when we need a time of year when we need to be looking at um, going out harvesting or going out mitigating areas or, or traditional burns. And that cycle it has been disrupted greatly because we can we, we we're seeing things that we don't normally see um, we're seeing you know for example budding um, in in the wrong time of the year uh, we're seeing one year and I want to be mindful of my time so um, please flag me I, I think I'm very close to my time being up so the last point would be one year when we went up in our territory in the Arrow Lakes, we we saw huckleberries that were charred on on the bush. And that's of concern to all of us. So I want to be mindful of the other speakers. And I, I do believe that I've taken up my, my five minutes because uh, I know we have some deep discussions to take place today. 
Yeah, no worries. You have you have a couple. You have at least a minute left if you really wanted to go a little bit longer. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. I guess one thing uh, within the time that you do have, do you have examples of at the top of your mind of uh, some of the more recent harvesters that you've connected with um, that have seen a drastic increase in their food security in that particular community, or have they had something that's um, gone from nothing to to something than what was there before. Yeah, so two years ago, we we I came home with one small basket of Saskatoon berry, and um, not only do we acquire our food uh, for our elders and for ourselves, but it's also really important that we conduct the ceremonies with the food and and um, practice that 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 within all of our food security measures and food sovereignty measures so you know it was it was definitely two years ago when when we had the heat dome maybe it was three my math could be off but we had no Saskatoon berries and so that was very alarming that was the same year that we didn't have huckleberries now the following year we did okay um, but year to year it it's it's a it's becoming more and more concerning uh, with with respect to not just our berries, um, with our plants, with our medicines, with the um, with the animals being chased out of the forest, um, not having their own food supply. Uh, we you know so hunting, you know we we depend on hunting to survive. We we still eat our wild meat. And it's part of our diet. And we have to not hunt because the numbers are down. And the traditional knowledge keepers know when the numbers are down. We just had a report last week of one female caribou that is left in, in, in the uh, Arrow Lakes area. And that's very alarming. And so, and we know that this is this is this is contributed to climate change. And um, so, you know, I'm hoping we can have some really good discussions and provide solutions today. So thank you. Thank you so much, Tracy. And yeah, those in-person, on-the-ground knowledge and experience and patterns are really critical for just even long-term range, you know, awareness of what's happening and changing in the community. Uh, so I'm very glad that people have been keeping an eye on that and that there is that oral history and that oral communication of what's happening on the ground. So for our next speaker, we have Tracy. I'm just adding in the questions here. So for those who can't hear it or if they wanna read it as we go along, those are there for your reference as well. Um, so with Oasis, or sorry, not Tracy, for uh, Lisa, uh, with Oasis, you have uh, worked extensively with the agricultural community in the region through ranchers, farmers, and indigenous communities. With that being said, can you explain at a high level some of the impacts that invasive species can have on our food systems based on your work with these communities? And how do land practices in the region need to change to adapt and provide resilience for our food systems? So there's a two-parter question there. Um, if you don't answer all of it, it's all good. But you've got some, you've got five minutes and a bit of change. <laughs> Wonderful, thanks Odessa. Um, I'm honored to be here tonight um, amongst um, the other panel speakers and, uh, and all the other Wonderful people that are here tonight. Um, thank you for coming out. So um, yeah, I'll I'll take I'll answer that of course in in the two parts. So first of all, I think it's important um, to understand what invasive species are, and um, that's that's stage one. So just for clarity's sake, for everyone, we're talking about um, uh, invasive. Uh, we're talking about species of plants. We're talking about insects, we're talking about disease, um, but all these um, different things, these different organisms have come from somewhere else. They've been introduced to our area. Typically, they've been introduced um, from quite far away, uh, overseas, Europe, Asia, um, Africa, but sometimes just from Eastern North America, and they've been moved either accidentally or purposefully into our region. Um, so the problem with um, not being um, indigenous to the area is they typically have come here without their natural enemies. 
So they lack, they, they have a competitive advantage and that competitive advantage allows them to um, take over um, environments, uh, both in our agricultural areas and in our natural areas. Um, and then by taking over, the, this presents a, a detriment, a harm to our environment, our economy, as well as our human health. Um, so understanding that, then taking it to the next step. So when it comes to our food systems, of course, um, I could spend the whole five minutes talking about what those negative impacts are when invasive species move in, but touching on some of the the key things, uh, it would be of, uh, you know, crop loss, uh, loss of quality, as well as uh, quantity, um, loss of medicines in our natural systems, um, uh, introduction of diseases, um, as well as the reduced income for agricultural producers, um, either because the quality or the yield is down, um, but also they have to expend a lot of uh, extra dollars to try and manage in the case of invasive plants, and they're spending more time, effort, dollars managing invasive plants um, to, to protect the cropland. Um, so those are just some of the impacts. And of course, a lot of these species can also be uh, spiny or they might be toxic. So um, they could cause a, a direct impact uh, to human health in that way, but also to our pets or, or to our livestock. And we've, we've seen loss of um, cattle in the area. Uh, as well as horses that have been directly impacted by um, poisonous plants that are invasive species. So the second part of the question was how, how do land practices in the region need to change to adapt and provide resilience for our food systems? So I think I'd start by, um, I mean, there's definitely a need for, for change and I'll touch on that. Um, but I also think it's important to take a step back and think more holistically. So I'll, um, you know, echo what Tracy was talking about. There's everything is so, so connected. Um, and so we already have had invasive species here for a long time. Um, and now we're adding an additional stressor of climate change. So it's kind of a, a, a double whammy right now. Um, but I think we need to cultivate our knowledge and truly understand the threat so we can better understand what the solutions are. So changing practices on the land are good, but first and foremost, and I, you know, I've been doing this for 26 years, but I learned this right at the get-go, and it's prevention. Prevention is the first thing we need to do. So um, try and prevent the problem um, before, it, before it starts. Um, and then if we um, see, uh, and, and that in call includes being aware of invasive species that are here, but also ones that are being promoted as um, in neighboring jurisdictions and might move here. And with climate change, we're seeing a lot of, um, especially invasive insects arriving on the East Coast of North America, getting transported across to the West Coast, we hear like insects right now are the big thing. They're showing up in California and Oregon. A lot of these have huge uh, impacts to our agricultural sector. And then they just funnel right up from, um, the, from California and Oregon. And then they show up in Washington. And sure enough, we know they're gonna arrive here. So be aware, uh, tap into different resources. Um, one that I'll draw your attention to that we have helped to develop is uh, a local website for the Okanagan Valley called Okanagan Invasive Species Online. So the acronym is OISO, O-I-S-O dot C-A. Um, we pulled together all the different invasive species we could think of. We're continually updating it, but right now it's uh, got over 80 different species. It's, it's primarily been developed for the agricultural sector um, in light of climate change and helping uh, them to be people to become more aware of what species to watch out for. And you can even look, depending on whether you're in the South Central or North Okanagan. Um, so check that website out. So number one, prevention, 
know what might be in your area, use the different resources on our various websites, and then report. Because we can, if we get on top of something when it just arrives and it hasn't established, that's going to go a long way to help us out. Um, but then getting into the idea of um, changing our land management practices. Um, what I would suggest there is, again, it's taking, uh, I always encourage everyone to first step back and think about what are your objectives for the land, thinking holistically and taking an integrated approach. So not just applying one tool and thinking that, you know, you can go and you can just clip that invasive plant and walk away. You need to think a little bit deeper. You need to think about um, the seeds that it may have already put into the soil, its root system, and how did it get there? Always reminding people about pathways of spread and not being a vector. And if we're disturbing soils, another key way of mitigating for invasive plants is to seed or plant those soils. So um, cultural uh, control options are really important to consider, but in general, just taking um, multiple approaches to uh, land management practices is really going to be your best approach for having effective results that are long term. Thank you so much, Lisa. That is um, a huge kind of eye opening reminder that yeah, we're not just looking at the top here. We have to look at the process that's received to get to that space and the underground components as well of that invasive species and where else uh, it might have impacts on. Because uh, there's a lot more to that system in place uh, than what we really see on uh, the surface there. So that's a, it's a really great reminder. And it's a perfect segue to, uh, to Ella as well because she's working on farms and you know how this in practice might look. So looking at um, Ella here, so you took the daunting task of converting five acres of uh, apple monocultures to what is now a sustainable polyculture farm. Can you explain what a polyculture farm is and how this three-year journey has changed your view on agricultural land practice, uh, practices and what food security uh, means to you? Sure. Um, thank you very much, Odessa. And first things first for hosting this. It's really wonderful for us to be able to have this discussion. And thank you, Lisa and Tracy. Um, Lisa, as you said, prevention, that's actually one of the main things that I was thinking about as like, what does it mean to be a sustainable farm? Um, so Odessa, I will, I will beg a little bit of forgiveness saying that I wouldn't call myself sustainable yet. I think that will be a lifelong journey trying to get to the point where I really feel like my farm is doing everything that I dream of it doing. Um, so a polyculture farm to me means biodiversity. It means that I'm not just taking the single species and looking at it from a almost industrial viewpoint of what is the species, what can it produce, but it means that I look at my goals, feeding my community, regenerating the soil, creating a sustainable ecosystem where the different elements of the ecosystem can feed off of each other and in the case of negative um, impacts on the system can help mitigate each other. And then I'm trying to build that ecosystem around the edible, medicinal, and other useful fiber or um, wood plants that the people in my community might need. So I'm trying to regenerate the soil by helping to build topsoil, increasing the biodiversity on my farm, improving the water and the water filtration as it moves through my farm, and enhancing the ecosystem services that my farm can provide both for itself and for the surrounding land and for my broader valley here in Prairie Valley in Summerland. Um, I try to minimize inputs and Lisa, to refer back to what you were talking about, I really try to engage in an idea of prevention, avoidance, monitoring and suppression, which means that as a farmer, there are times when I will step in and intervene, but you all, I always intervene as early as possible. If I can prevent a problem, that is the best solution. If an avoidant, if a problem does crop up, 
try to avoid the problem, you know, isolate that plant or find a way to help the plant regain its health and then monitor, just be aware of what's going on. After that, that might be when I need to suppress, you know, put some baking soda onto a squash plant that's developing powdery mildew or something like that. But any inputs are only used after con careful consideration and after all other options have been tried. Um, you asked about what I've learned about land practices. Um, the ALR is essential. Um, if we're going to be feeding our community and creating a resilient food system around ourselves, we need somewhere to grow that land. Um, here in Summerland, secondary suites and increasing the size of farm home plates for luxury homes is starting to price growers out of the market. And so if we want to keep this really special treasure of the South Okanagan and its wonderful eco region where we can find food, grow food, and the land provides for us so beautifully, we do need to protect that. And the ALR is a big point of that. I think I felt that strongly going in. And as I've been on this journey over the past few years, I've only become more passionate about it. There are organizations throughout the world. Um, there's a great one in Toronto looking at how farmers can use some public land and how First Peoples can use the public land as well for food security. There's a group in France that um, buys up agricultural land and helps not place a cap, but prevent speculation on agricultural land um, and helps match young farmers with that land. There are wonderful solutions to the agricultural land practices and I hope that we're able to continue protecting our land here in the Okanagan so that we can continue feeding ourselves and the generations to come. Um, let me see, is there anything else that you asked? I'm looking over at the chat right now. <laughs> um, I mentioned as well, uh, oh. if you have an idea, what does food security mean to you? And especially based off of what you've learned and done over the last a uh, few years doing that polyculture farm. Absolutely. Um, so food security to me means that my local community is able to eat healthy food that is produced or found here in the Okanagan. It means that as a farmer, I'm able to grow and sell enough food at a fair price, both to me and to all of the people who desire that food that it works for them and it works for me. Um, it means, this is something I've been spending a lot of time dwelling on, that we probably need a regionally adapted diet that is not the same as diets all over the rest of North America. Tracy could speak to this much more and more knowledgeably than I can, but if we expect the same food here or in Toronto or in Yellowknife, our food systems won't be resilient because the food has to come from somewhere else. And so to me, where my mental space is right now is really <laughs> like, what does food security really mean about our diets and how we choose to live our lives? That is a very excellent point that I haven't uh, heard yet in um, academic career or even in my my working career so I think that's something that a lot of us will be thinking about tonight um, after this discussion and you know thinking about the next season coming up here uh, with our food and our crops that are coming out slowly with the spring uh, you know where can we see our regional food coming from um, and thank you so much to all three of you uh, for answering those questions there's been some great connections of just being able to listen to the land and look at what's happening there and really understanding you know why it's hurting or what is happening as and that's the best way to understand what we have currently and what we're missing um and yeah both with 
on the land experience and scientific experience and the traditional knowledge experience as well. Those are all three really important focuses and components of understanding food security uh, and food resilience. Uh, they all have a place in different ways, uh, so that meshing together uh, can be very powerful. So for the next set, uh, this is our part two, um, and this is the group question. So uh, I will prevent, I will present uh, the questions, and then I will give each speaker uh, five minutes to respond again. Um, it, we, we will go in the reverse order. So Ella, we'll start with you um, and then we'll go to Lisa and then we'll go to Tracy uh, to finish us off. So as I did before, I'm gonna copy and paste the question here so that everyone can see it. Okay, so as a bit of context, uh, we're going into the food sovereignty portion of this discussion. Uh, so food sovereignty has been defined by the Ulaney De uh, Declaration uh, in 2007 as the rights of peoples to healthy and culturally appropriate food produced through ecologically sound and sustainable methods and their right to define their own food and agriculture systems. So there's two parts to this in the sense that if you can respond to one or the other, you are more than welcome to, Ella, um, depending on which one you feel more confident uh, responding to based off of your knowledge and experience. So the first one, uh, if you're able to, food sovereignty encapsulates a number of social, environmental, and cultural factors that contribute to its understanding and integration in a community. How has food sovereignty been practiced or understood through your respective work, community, or lived experiences? And the alternative, if uh, that one doesn't uh, speak to you, is if no experience with food sovereignty, how do you see food sovereignty threatened uh, from the impacts of climate change based off of kind of the definition and broader overall understanding as to what uh, food sovereignty is. So I'll leave it to you, Ella. Sure. Um, I won't pretend to be an expert on food sovereignty, but I feel like part of the question of what we eat and how we choose to eat is about the sovereignty. And right now in the Okanagan, um, there's increasing acreage for cherries and for grapes and the acreage for other food plants um, like grains, dairy, other proteins and for foraging land is decreasing as cherry and grape acreage increases. And I see that as a, not necessarily climate change but as an anthropogenic threat to our food sovereignty. And it's, a giant question. I don't have an answer to it, but it's a something that I think we all need to be thinking about is how do we value the economics of the food that we are choosing to consume and the cultural aspects of the food that we're choosing to consume. Um, I have some resources that um, I think others might want to be able to look at. There was a, pardon, there was a study done by the Quantum Polytechnic Inter, uh, uh, there we go, um, university that um, looked at the Okanagan bioregion and the food systems within it and how those food systems might evolve as time goes on. Um, that's the third thing that I list right here. I'm going to um, quickly interrupt you. We don't, I can't see the words on the screen there. I don't know if anyone else is able to, if anyone wanted to put their thumbs up or down there uh, to confirm if they can see it. Is that any better? No. No. Okay. Then I will just pop this into the chat. Yeah. Copy um, and paste it. That's all good. Yeah. So the first that I was mentioning was the KPU report on the Okanagan bioregion food system. And it looks at several future scenarios and is a wonderful, I mean, it's a dense read, but it's a wonderful read for anyone who um, is interested in it. And here is that one. Then the city of Penticton looked into food security and regional food sovereignty um, and put together a report on that that folks are welcome to look at. And um, again, Tracy, 
if you would like to add to this, I feel you would probably know a lot more than I do. But the Okanagan Nation Alliance has um, put together a pretty good report about um, food sovereignty and the ways that we as um, residents of the Okanagan can really be cognizant of what we are doing and how it affects the wild foods around us. And those are up. All right, thank you so much. And as someone who is also not as familiar with food sovereignty, while it's been there, you know, there's kind of that high level understanding. Um, I can appreciate the, the time taken to try and understand it and the resources that you're able to find in order to better inform. And I think for all of us, it's a, something to strive to. It is um, an important component of food security and resilience. Um, it is also one that is defined in uh, slightly different ways and means slightly different things for different people uh, and groups of people as well. Uh, so there is a bit of fluidity with the kind of uh, a way it's applied and defined, but also the broader high level uh, understanding is generally the same. Um, but of course, depending on who you go to, they might say otherwise. But um, yeah, it is a, it's a complex question. I definitely don't expect any world changing answers today, but something to give people food for thought. So pardon the pun there, but also it's a great pun. So it works very well for today. Uh, so I'm going to go to Lisa. Uh, the same question to you. Um, the question is in the text there. I won't repeat myself to save some time, uh, but feel free to answer uh, either the A or B, uh, whichever you are most confident and uh, comfortable with. Great. Thanks, Odessa. Uh, yeah, I, I definitely don't have um, experience with food sovereignty. So I think, though, um, looking at food sovereignty and, and threats from the impacts of climate change, of course, I'll be coming at it from an invasive species perspective. And um, all, the, all the research, all the studies are showing that um, most invasive species uh, are only going to proliferate um, and do better. They're more adaptable um, in light of climate change. Whereas a lot of our, um, our native species, our native plants, uh, our, our natural areas, um, they're not as resilient. And of course, added to that is, are, are the, all the impacts that um, we continue to impart on our landscapes when we, when we do um, clear large areas and when we, we build more infrastructure and more roads, um, and then we're disturbing more ecosystems in move the invasive plants along comes climate change, which just exacerbates the situation. So um, it, it's ultimately climate change is making areas more vulnerable um, to invasive plants, which is just uh, uh, this, um, I guess, ongoing threat to our food sovereignty. Um, so the more we can, again, as I was speaking about earlier, is just being aware of uh, invasive species and making areas as best as we can less vulnerable to their um, arrival as well as to their spread. So I think the more that, and I guess I'll just kind of take it to um, uh, on more of a positive note on what we can do um, is needing to incorporate native plants and native foods into our urban landscape and our local food producing systems. So um, we are a big proponent as are many of our colleagues around British Columbia about the, the plant wise program. So instead of just telling people don't plant this invasive this is invasive plant, it's plant this instead. And um, I worked on, um, we developed a, a plant wise guide specific for the Okanagan. It is on our website, um, which is oasis.ca. And I worked very closely with Tracy on this. And so we have some uh, insulchion translation. And what I endeavored to do in that particular plant wise guide is to focus um, not just on drought tolerant species, but on indigenous species that are locally available. Um, they are medicines, they are 
Um, they are food sources, but they're also um, food for our wildlife species. They help to bind the soil better. Um, they help to enrich the soil. And I think um, the more we can incorporate native plants um, into our landscapes as, as drought tolerant foods, as medicines, as wildlife plant hosts, um, we can better sustain ourselves and we can better sustain um, the bees, the butterflies um, and all the wildlife um, around there as well. So again, I'm a huge proponent of that big picture, holistic um, approach to, um, to managing and to um, reducing uh, the threat that we're talking about tonight. Thank you, Lisa. And I've gone and linked uh, that particular plant-wise guide from uh, the website there. Uh, so if you wanna check it out, um, always a great resource to have locally. And so to uh, finish us off here, uh, Tracy, I will uh, give you the floor there and feel free to answer uh, one or the other, uh, whatever you are comfortable with. Thank you. I wanted to respond, uh, first of all, to um, what Ella was mentioning about our local diet, uh, because I agree 100%. And I, I agree 100% that we could be making contributions towards um, a, a, a significant change um, if we are, you know, following paths of regenerating the soil um, and really keeping important areas like the ALR areas so that we can, we can change our diets to a local diet. So I, I just wanted to make a remark on that. I, I think that, you know, like the word where I work is is a place called Anaukin Center, and Anaukin, the Anaukin we process really says is that um, each one of us has a part of the solution, and and so we're all working together uh, to come up with um, our our best ideas to put forward um, in looking at some of the things that are impacting us today. So in terms of our cult, in terms of uh, seal people and indigenous people around the world, we know that we're, you know, we know that, um, you know, some people are, are more familiar with the Declaration and Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And what does that mean? What does that look like? And more recently, the province of British Columbia um, um, took on a framework with Indigenous people and, and uh, legislated the DRIPA Act. Um, and so what does that mean for us and how do we work together? I think one of the important components is if, if we look at it um, in terms of holistically, for us as seal people, our culture is our sovereignty. And so, um, and it's a matter of how we maintain it in our lives as a society, as a family, and as a nation. And so when we think about food security, we're thinking about how are we going to, um, how are we going to bring our, our young people to these areas so that they, they can experience that right that they've always been given to have that diet that their body and their DNA um, has known for thousands of years. And we know that with the health of the diet improving, the health of the community and the health of of um, the whole system around it is going to occur. And, and, and so that's, the, that's really exciting. I think um, another um, really key component of, of food sovereignty, and we can think about this as well in terms of agricultural uh, terms, is gathering our food, and the knowledge of that requires, there's a requirement of the places we live within. And so I, I really, I really like what, what Ella was saying about, about if we think about uh, getting our food from the very places that we live within a region, I think then that gives, that challenges us to behave in a way um, that is reciprocal. 
And each place will require us to act within its reciprocity as part of our everyday living. And I think that that's really exciting. Um, and we think of our food systems uh, holistically as a, as a force of human interactions within it. And that's why I, I didn't just mention the human um, aspect of food security, food sovereignty. We must think about the plants and the animals as living beings, as our relatives, um, and them needing food and them needing security as well. Um, some really exciting things are happening. Um, you know, there are modern seal organizations that are engaged in decolonizing, you know, their own institutions through modern culturally relevant and ecologically responsive governance models, management systems related to health, education, land use, and economics. And this is all fundamental to restoring community health and also uh, restoring food security for all of us. And so, you know, in closing, I, I want to say that, you know, I am involved in a, in a very exciting project called the Silk, Bu Silk Bush Learning Center, where we are engaging in bringing, um, uh, bringing, uh, creating education out on the land um, in terms of providing Western science and ho hopefully laddering our, our learners into STEM programs within the uh, academic institutions, but more importantly, reclaiming our knowledge um, so that we can help provide solutions for the health of the people and health of our land. And I think, you know, in closing, I want to say it is possible. You know, our chiefs did dream about um, us bringing sockeye back to um, to the Okanagan, um, and there was collaborations with international and federal departments of fisheries and oceans, um, and and we have the um, return of the sockeye back to the Okanagan River system. So um, you know, I I think I think if we collaborate and we work together and we really focus on not all of us doing the same thing, but us doing parts, uh, contributing our parts to that solution. I, I, you know, and I know groups like this and if forums like this are very critical um, in terms of us moving forward with us moving together and, and working together and sharing our knowledge together. And um, I wanna thank Lisa for, um, you know, the, the the um, invasive species, because that's definitely something that's impacting our food systems uh, within the seal people. And, um, and we do our best to mitigate. Uh, in cl closing, I'll say there's one plant that I keep, re I keep removing and I'm working with Penticton Band Natural Resources, and that's the tansy. Uh, and I and there's always one that pops up and it's stubborn. And as soon as I see it come up, I get, I ask natural resources to go down there and remove it because if it spreads, um, it's, it's going to choke out a lot of our, our food systems. So, um, you know, I've been, uh, I've been, I've been uh, tasked with also <laughs> uh, keeping an eye out for, for that invasive. So I want to leave room for everybody else. And so why he, thank you. Thank you so much, Tracy. So we're at, uh, so thank you to all the, the speakers today. Um, we're at uh, just before 7.50 here. And uh, yeah, your, your talking points here have given me so many things to think about and the threads of connection between everyone um, and just the, the issues that we're seeing in the Okanagan especially uh, are just slowly coming together in my head. Uh, so I hope the same is happening for you guys. Um, now with 10 minutes left, um, I did promise that there would be a question and answer period. And I have been copying and pasting some of the questions uh, from here. So if you haven't had a chance, uh, you're more than welcome to throw your hand up and you can turn your audio on or you can continue adding to the chat. Um, I'll start with the chat ones that I've collected over the span of uh, the last uh, 40 minutes or so uh, to get those out. And then if there's any extras, uh, we can potentially address those at the last 10 minutes. Uh, so to start, um, there we go. 
So specifically a question to Lisa, uh, should we pull out a plant species if we see it, uh, assuming that is an invasive plant species? Uh, what are your thoughts on that, Lisa? Um, I generally discourage it unless you really know what you're doing. Um, if, if it's invasive, it but it might be, you know, it might have a toxic sap and you could, you know, um, cause a problem on your hand. Um, but also um, just pulling creates a soil disturbance in itself. Like it's really understanding the plant and its life cycle and how it grows. Um, when I started a quarter of a century ago, weed pulls were a big thing. We don't do a lot of weed pulls because actually they cause a lot of soil disturbance and often encourage a lot more invasives to grow. So, um, and another thing, I've seen it on trails, people love to pull toad flax. Well, you're actually just, you know, knowing that it grows with rhizomes, specialized stems that grow under the ground like roots, you're encouraging it to bud up and by by pulling it like that, there was probably some biocontrol agents or natural insect enemies and you just took their home away. So yeah, don't just do it without understanding the plant, how it grows, and if it's really going to be an effective tool. If anyone else uh, had any thoughts on that, I know it was directed to Lisa, but if anyone, uh, Tracy or Ella, if you have any experience, uh, definitely feel free to contribute to that one. Uh, no, I completely agree with Lisa, which is why I don't go and yank that one nasty tansy out mm -hmm. on my own along Green Mountain Road. I actually, um, we have Penticton Union Bad Natural Resources that know how to uh, uh, remove that. Um, and, um, but there was a, a little patch up Green Mountain Road that we were able to, it's there, it's not, hasn't come back in three years. So I'm quite happy about that. So that's absolutely, thank you, Lisa, for that information, because that's the way that I went about it. Mm -hmm. Ella, did you have anything for that one as well? No? I mean, Lisa's the expert here. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. <laughs> What's it all? Those dandelions, those are the, the vein of some people's existence. So you never know. <laughs> um, so, yeah, <laughs> they are good. <laughs> I've heard. <laughs> um, so one, th this is kind of an open one. And again, anyone uh, between the three speakers, so you're more than welcome to step in. Uh, it's another uh, weed question, nap weed. Uh, what is the most effective way to eradicate it? Um, I, they uh, heard that introducing weevils is an option or foraging goats. We do have goats in Summerland, so it wouldn't be completely out of the question. <laughs> um, rarely do I like to just, there isn't just one easy answer for every invasive species. It would be, you know, I, I've, I've actually had conversations with people over the phone about their napweed and I've showed up with insects and yes, that's biological control, natural insect enemies. And I arrived and it was a field of mustard. Um, so I have learned over the years that people struggle with identification. So um, I always like to go to a property or and confirm, you know, what the species is and how widespread is it and what are the soils like and what are their objectives for the land and, you know, and so we have to go, it's, it's again, it's that big picture thinking, it's being very holistic. Um, goats, yeah, I I'm not fond of, of that particular type of um, way of, of managing in, invasives, at least the, the deep-rooted perennials that I deal with. I think goats could have a, a way of um, like targeted grazing using goats or using uh, livestock could can be an effective tool and I think it should be explored in the right place. Um, but whoever asked that question, um, you know, please reach out to me directly and then I can I can help you come up with um, the best option for the particular situation you're talking about. Thank you for that. It's a uh, yes, <laughs> especially out here, I find uh, having lived in a few provinces, some of the plants look a little bit the same to me. So um, definitely important to talk to the right person. Uh, so don't go pulling that nap weed unless you know 100% and someone has confirmed it. Um, I don't know. I want to say Ella and Tracy, if you had any comments on that, but it sounds like Lisa had a pretty good response and a very balanced approach to it. So you're more than welcome to. Um, but this question is a, a good one as well. And this can be um, 
I, it could be answered by a couple of people, I think. Uh, so as insects, animals, and plants move to other locations as a result of climate change, is it difficult to determine what are truly invasive? So if anyone feels like they can answer that, you are more than welcome. Um, I, I, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. So I, I just, I think, that um, I mean, invasive is is its own term in its own right. I think um, we can even have um, indigenous species that can have invasive tendencies. I think clematis is an example, and it doesn't mean we want to get rid of it. It just can start to creep along and and uh, move into um, other areas. But it's it's all about finding that balance. Um, but I think um, I think ultimately I think what I got to go back to the actual question. Can you just repeat it? Yeah. Um, so it says, um, is it difficult to determine what are truly invasive since many animals, insects, and plants move to other locations as a result of climate change? So I guess as climate is starting to slowly change the um, kind of original biogeographical locations of all these uh, flora and fauna, what is now truly an invasive species? Is there even the ability to do that right now in the 2020s to say something like that? Yeah, I, I don't think it's really changed the the how you define an invasive species. I just I think what we're seeing more is climate change and globalization and increased trade is is what's just exacerbating the problem. So we're probably just we've become more aware. And because of all those things I've mentioned, we're getting more and more species. So we're just seeing more invasive species, but it doesn't change how it's defined. Mm -hmm. And Tracy, you can go ahead. You've got your hand up there. Yeah, um, I'm not speaking too much on the definition, but more the responsibility, um, you know, in terms of a natural ecosystem and um, the, you know, the, the ability for that ecosystem to continue to regenerate itself um, over time for um, for us as human beings, for the um, original species that have been here for thousands of years. And I think that really needs to be looked at in terms of what are we going to be doing as, as, as human beings to be responsible in our generation um, to um, not doing anything about red listed and blue listed species that are, you know, on, you know, are, are highly critically endangered. And so um, I think that's, that's the part that I think we really, I think it really, ne really needs to be looked at. Um, because without one part of that chain and when, when that that one web, the, the web of, of all of the survival of an entire ecosystem, whether it's a semi-arid desert or whether it's in the rainforest, it's the natural world and the natural setting. And that and that that I think is is something that we, you know, today really need to be concerned about. Um, and that does impact food security in our food systems. So yeah, that I just wanted to comment on that. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, we've got about a minute left. Uh, Ella, did you want to add anything to that particular question or uh, any thoughts on that as you've um, kind of been listening? Um, just to highlight, I think to summarize a little bit of what Lisa was saying is that there's a difference between invasive and introduced, that there are many introduced species that are not necessarily problematic. And a lot of the ones on my farm are species that don't come from North America, but they are still beneficial to the people here. So a plant changing its bioregion as a result of, com of climate change it, as Lisa said, there are things that are native that have invasive tendencies, but a plant changing its bioregion isn't a sign that it's invading necessarily. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, that's a very, very good point. Um, I appreciate that clarification there. Um, so it is eight o'clock and I haven't seen any new questions on the chat there. I have one person who says, is knapweed edible? Um, 
<laughs> yeah, um, I, I actually heard there was uh, some research done years ago in the Maritimes and someone made paper out of it. Um, but yeah, I mean, they do have redeeming qualities. I usually do at least one article a year on the redeeming qualities of invasive species. I have people that come up to me and talk about St. John's wort, for example, but uh, if we could at least contain it and not have it out in nature where we're getting monocultures of these unwanted plants, and mm -hmm. um, that's what we'd want to do, but not out in our natural systems or it's causing all the problems we're talking about tonight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. All I did right. an episode called The Invasive Meal, Burdock Root and, uh, <laughs> and Cattail uh, combined together, and it was pretty good soup. <laughs> <laughs> if anything, collect it and keep it and you can eat it. It's almost like a bit of revenge on the invasive species there. <laughs> You're going to come through, we'll just eat you. <laughs> there's a fantastic wild food expert named Steve Brill, whose um, blog is called Eat the Weeds. <laughs> There you go. The ultimate revenge. <laughs> All right. So as much as I want to keep the conversation going, I am going to be cognizant of the time. It is 8.02 PM. I will hand it off um, to either Lori or Margaret to close us off. Uh, but thank you so much uh, to all of our speakers, Tracy, Ella, and Lisa, uh, your value, your knowledge and sharing and uh, interest in all these topics has been so valuable and so great to have here today. Uh, so thank you again. I hope we cross paths. Um, and I will hand it off uh, to Lori or Margaret to, to close us today. Uh, I'll just say thank you very much, everyone, for attending. And I know my mind was blown several times just by listening to some of the um, thoughts that I hadn't thought of before, food security, including every living species, um, I think is a wonderful thought to end with, and Ella Braden's uh, regionally adapted diets. Lisa, we also heard a lot of sensible uh, advice to, uh, as uh, each of us is um, an occupier of the Okanagan. So um, you've all shown us something about living in this region with more intention. So thank you very much to all of you. And good night, everyone. Thank you so Hi. much. Hey.